this first hour. Uh, on Sunday morning, we have two classes, 10 o'clock and 11.15 right now. And uh, this is Grace and Truth Bible Church, and I'm Pastor Gary Glennie. Welcome aboard. Thank you for joining us in uh, parts all around the world and uh, around the country. So thank you so much for joining with us. We've got a rather large congregation out there and an in-house congregation here. So thank you so much. Uh, we study verse by verse from the original languages and uh, the, uh, uh, the local church is the classroom for the royal family. It's where we learn the things of God, where we're edified of soul, and uh, we become those who do what's pleasing in the sight of God because we want to understand the person and the work of Jesus Christ and the magnificent plan that he has for us. Uh, we, of course, at Grace and Truth Bible Church teach the whole Bible, every verse in the Bible, every time, all the time. So we're glad that you've joined with us this morning. We mentioned uh, last week, I didn't mention in the first hour, and I'm sure that uh, some of you have already taken uh, into account the two great films that are out there. I think they're probably still playing uh, for a week or so. Uh, one of them is Reagan. Uh, it's all about Ronald Reagan. Just a great, great dramatization there. Dennis Quaid just does a marvelous job of presenting Reagan and takes a while to get used to it because we knew Ronald Reagan, saw him, saw him in person one time, and so trying to see somebody else and visualize him. But he had the mannerisms, just did a great job. And uh, uh, Dennis Quaid, from what I understand, is a Christian, so uh, it was uh, just really, really well done. The Kendricks brothers, I don't know if they did that one or not. That's a different group. But the other one's The Forge by the Kendricks brothers, and that, of course, uh, is... Uh, uh, the people that did The War Room, if you saw that one. Some really great Christian films. I understand there's another one coming out. I guess this is the third installment of God is Not Dead. So uh, God has given us some, uh, some cinema that we can actually take family and unbelieving friends to and hopefully have a chance to uh, interface with them and to present the claims of Jesus Christ to our unsaved friends. Uh, just, uh, just a good time to go with family friends, and so uh, hope that you'll take advantage of that. Uh, we're praying that it has great outreach, and that cinema, since so much of cinema today is hostile to the Word of God and to the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, we pray for these that are uh, doing what uh, we would consider the uh, uh, invading the uh, mm -hmm. Hollywood area of cinema. Well, okay, uh, I think that's all the announcements I had. Uh, if you uh, would like to give to the Ministry of Grace and Truth Bible Church, you can do that. You send any um, check or money order to this home address, my home address. But make sure on the envelope you put Grace and Truth Bible Church and also on any check or money order uh, because I put those immediately into our grace box over here and the deacons take care of all the finances, the administration uh, in this local church. I have nothing to do with any of the funding, and that's the way we like it. We don't sell anything. Everything that we have here is on the grace basis, and if you'd like to participate uh, in that way by giving according to uh, the, the will that you have to purpose in your heart, uh, do it uh, without grudging, then God loves a cheerful giver. So if you can do it on that basis and graciously, please do it. We thank you so much for your grace gifts, and more importantly, we thank you for your listening and your attention during our class. Thank you so much. It is our custom at the beginning of each of our classes, as you know, to take a few moments for silent prayer. Uh, this is something we should do moment by moment throughout the day, acknowledging any sins that we're aware of, making sure that we have not lost the connection that is the filling or enabling of the Holy Spirit. As believers in Jesus Christ, we all have permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but the enabling or filling, we might say the empowering of the Holy Spirit, can be temporarily interrupted by personal sins. That's why throughout the scripture, in fact, they had sin offerings for the known and unknown sins in the Old Testament. And we see that addressed in passages in the New Testament, particularly 1 John 1, 9, which says, if we believers confess our sins, that is name them, cite them, agree with God as they come to our mind, uh, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, the ones we acknowledge, because Christ paid for all sins on the cross, and at the same time to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this is an act of personal cleansing moment by moment to make sure that we have the enabling or filling of the Holy Spirit. 
So with that in mind and in preparation for our study in this second hour this morning, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your magnificent plan, the grace that you give to us in every day and the mercy that you extend to us through your son, Jesus Christ, and through every avenue, angelic and otherwise, that you provide all the needs for us moment by moment and day by day. We thank you so much, and we're so grateful for the salvation that you've provided through the death of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary. We thank you for the life that you've given to us that we can enjoy the blessings that you've provided for us. And again, we hope that we do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Help us to do that as we study your word and are edified of soul. And we pray it in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and with all your strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And, of course, making melody with our heart to the Lord, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approach. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word this morning to the epistle by Paul to the Philippians in chapter 1, and we were looking at 27 and verse 28. We just finished verse 28 in the first hour, if you were with us. If you missed that, you can go back and pick it up. Uh, we do have outlines available. Go to the website, Grace and Truth Bible Church. At the top of the homepage, it has a menu there for charts and graphs and outlines and various helps that you can have. It's a drop-down type menu. And, of course, we have over 100 doctrinal studies, various subjects throughout the Bible that you can use for your own personal study, devotion, or perhaps to even have your own Bible study with friends and family. So all of that material is available at the website. If you do have the outline, we have some here available on the table. Uh, we now have about two chapters done. It takes me a while to go through and do the outline because I develop my own outline based on the grammar and the syntax in the original language. So actually, in this section, we're looking at uh, exhortations, challenges by the great apostle Paul, starting in verse 27 through the end of this chapter. And so we looked at 27 and noted there that we are to uh, have a, a behavioral conduct that is commensurate with the word of God when we approach the unbeliever and those in the cosmic system around the world. In other words, the body politic, that is all people that we come in contact with, not just other believers. And so that our behavior is uh, exemplary so that we can present the gospel of Jesus Christ. He mentions it twice in this verse. Uh, dealing with the faith of the gospel, which is the fact that the gospel is appropriated by faith, that is, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for our so great salvation. In the first hour, as we do in every class, we present the gospel multiple times to make sure that people understand how it is that they can have a relationship with God Almighty through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So we did that, and we're down to the section here that talked about uh, striving, not only struggling, uh, but uh, for the faith of the gospel, but not being alarmed by those who are in opposition. And so we saw in verse 28, then it says, do not be alarmed by the opponents or those in opposition. So uh, uh, yours truly uh, got into a preaching moment in the first hour about uh, uh, being able to deal with adversity in terms of uh, those who oppose whatever you present. We spoke about Paul on the Areopagus, that's Mars Hill over in Corinth, uh, where he presented the claims of Jesus Christ. 
And I'll reiterate, he said he came to town and he was up there with all the intelligentsia and they all presented and Paul said, uh, may I uh, have a word? And he said, oh yes, uh, uh, Rabbi Paul, go ahead. And so he, he began to uh, talk and uh, uh, he said, I was coming into town and I saw all these statues of various gods and goddesses and I saw one to the unknown god. And he said, and uh, I just want to let you know, I know him. <laughs> and I'm sure they all went, what? And uh, they got their attention, you see. And that's how we have to get the gospel to people. Got to get their attention. When years ago, we used to do it with weightlifting in the schools, and that got their attention. Then we'd give them the gospel. You're not even allowed to do that in public school anymore. But we did it back in the day, and it was a great opportunity. At any rate, Paul gave the gospel, presented the person of Jesus Christ and the unknown God, and then the results were some people turned away and said, this guy's nuts, <laughs> which is what we get sometimes when we give the gospel. Other people said, that's very interesting, Paul. I'll have to think about that. I'll cogitate on that. And then some people believed. And that's really the way it is when you give the gospel. Some people will just dismiss you and say, I'm not interested in that. Get away with that religious stuff. You know, I don't want to hear about it. Uh, they just dismiss you. Other people will say, oh, that's very interesting. Uh, I go to this church or that church or I have this philosophy or I go to Alcoholics Anonymous or whatever it is. Uh, they do something in place of uh, faith in Jesus Christ. And so uh, they'll think about this person you're talking about. And some people believe, and that's what you're going to be faced with. The point of this verse is do not be alarmed. Do not be put out. It's not you they're attacking. It's the gospel. It's the person of Jesus Christ. You can have a wonderful party, and suddenly uh, in the world system, you start talking to somebody about <laughs> Jesus Christ and salvation, and the whole party just gets quiet. And everybody kind of looks at you. Where did this guy, where did this religious nut come from? And you can dampen out almost any party in the world by talking about Jesus Christ, unless you take an individual aside and do it privately. If you try to do this in a, in a large area uh, of a party situation, not a good idea, because obviously people have all kinds of opinions, and you're going to be shouted down even if somebody is interested. So you have to pick your moments. Let the Holy Spirit direct you uh, to the place where you can minister. Maybe it's a person you meet in a store. Maybe it's at the gym, anywhere. But make sure the setting is right and that you, pardon me, present the gospel respectfully and clearly giving them an opportunity to believe in Jesus Christ. And do not take offense if somebody seems to uh, want to challenge you or verbally or mentally spit in your eye or <laughs> actually uh, attack you in some way, let it go. Your job is not to argue about the scripture. It's happened to me many times as a young Christian. I often would get into arguments, especially when we went to some of the colleges where there were so many liberals and anti-God. And uh, we had back in the day the Moonies. I don't know if you're familiar with those. And uh, uh, just a, a lot of different uh, groups that were some of them claimed Christian but were not. Others were into New Age types thing, all kind of thing. And we would present the gospel and this, all kinds of arguments. And I used to get into those arguments. The scripture says, don't do that. Present the gospel clearly. And if they reject it, whatever, let it go. You can pray for them later. But your job is simply to give a clear presentation. I know it's hard because we always want to stick our personality, our person in it, and we feel personally attacked. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And this passage addresses that. That's why I'm making such a big deal because it says here, Do not be alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them. If they're unbelievers and they stay in that condition... Till they die, they go to the lake of fire forever and ever and share it with Satan and the false uh, and, the, uh, and the demons. And that's their destiny. So their destruction is, this is a sign they reject Christ. That's their destruction. And so you're trying to keep them from that lake of fire. I still remember Dr. Gutsky back in Campus Crusade. He was one of our great instructors. He had a double doctorate, one in philosophy and one in Bible, and uh, just a great guy. And he was talking about the fact that the gospel and believing in Christ, it's a scary business. 
you know, because we're talking about eternal separation from God as opposed to eternal destiny in the presence of God and Jesus Christ. And he says, you know, if people are a little bit frightened, it's okay because it's a scary business to fall into the hands of the living God. And so it is. But it's not your job to scare them. <laughs> the gospel can do it very well without your help. You don't have to come with expressions we used to hear, turn or burn, sinner. You know, that's not going to win people to Christ. Give them the gospel clearly. You know, there's a God that created the universe, and, uh, uh, you know, they may reject that. And you say, well, I know him, just like Paul. And uh, uh, he's the Lord Jesus Christ, and he died on the cross for our sins. And you can have everlasting life. You can be with him forever if you simply believe that. Some will say, I'm ready. What do I do? And you say, well, right now we can just, uh, you can just believe. Then maybe you can offer up as a prayer to God the Father. And uh, uh, you're a member of the royal family. Or they go their way and they reject it. Or maybe they just want to think about it. Don't badger them. Don't follow them and say, but, 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 but. Don't be a motorboat. Let them go. Just let it go. <laughs> you did your job in the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit do his job convicting them and bringing them to the point where they make a decision, and then he, the Holy Spirit, will regenerate them, and they'll be members of the family. You did your job, and let it go there. I can't say that enough. And that's what he's saying here uh, to the Philippians. He's saying to them, don't let this opposition be a problem, because it's a, the fact that they reject you is destruction for them. But to you, it's deliverance. And we noted in the first hour, that's phase two deliverance. That means that you're not only eternally saved, but that's part of the Christian life. You'll be delivered from this opposition, and you move on, and you do the will of God. Uh, sometimes it may cause you to uh, lose your life, and therefore that may be the result of the opposition. They may want to destroy you or kill you, uh, but don't work on that now. You don't know if you're ever going to be a martyr. You don't know. If it's a time and God wants you to be a martyr, he will give you the spiritual sustenance to be able to bear up with that. But don't work on it now and think, oh, what would I do? What would I do? We have to live right now. Let it go. God knows what he's doing, and he will prepare you accordingly. And so it says here, it's salvation for you, and that too comes from God. That's where we left off in the last hour. Salvation, whether it's eternal life uh, at the moment of believing or day-by-day day salvation, it is all from God, as is our resurrection from the dead. And the rapture is all from God, who is the source of everything. We spend some time on that. I looked at a great passage in Philippians, or in 1 Peter 3.14 that deals with this very same subject in the first hour. I'm not going there. It was 1 Peter 3.14. But I did want to go to chapter 4 of 1 Peter. So let's go over to... 1 Peter chapter 4. We looked at 3.14, but Paul continues this in chapter 4 of 1 Peter 4.14. And actually all the way down here uh, to the end of the passage, which is in verse 19. I'm going to read all of this because this is really important. And if it's one message that I want to give this morning, and you had to say, well, what did he talk about? I talked about giving the gospel clearly and not being annoyed by the opposition. Do not be angered by the opposition, but just let it go. You did your job as unto the Lord. Uh, don't have any distractions that you put or complications or anger on top of that. Notice verse 14. He goes on and says, uh, if you are reviled. <laughs> have you ever been reviled? Uh, I have. I hope, I hope you haven't, but sooner or later, if you're a believer and you give the gospel, you're going to be reviled. If you are reviled, there's a first-class condition, and you will be if you haven't been. For the name of Christ. Now, you might be reviled because you've done something foolish or stupid or sinful. Uh, that's a different story, and you get called on the carpet. You deserve that. 
whatever punishment's coming, maybe it's a criminal act. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about being reviled for the name of Christ. What does the word name mean? It has multiple meanings in Scripture. We have a personal name. Mine's Gary. My wife's Judy. We have personal names. But then I'm also a pastor. That's a title. Or like Mr. or like Doctor. Those are titles. But most important is not your personal name or your title. It's your reputation. He has a name for honesty. He has a name for faithfulness. He has a name for integrity. That's your reputation. That's the important one. Whatever your name is, people change their names. God changed Paul's name from Saul to Paul, uh, from Saul to the little one, Paul, and uh, went to uh, Paul from Saul. So names are incidental. They do have significance and meaning, and your title may be important. Some people say, well, I have a doctorate in theology. Well, I've met some guys that had doctorates in theology, didn't know spit about the Bible. You wonder where'd they get it, on a matchbook cover? Anyway, they had a name or a title, but it had nothing to do with what was inside of them. It's the integrity. It's the righteousness of Christ. It is what you believe. It is your values that determine your name. You get it? Name. So it says if you've been reviled for the name of Christ, that is the reputation. What's that? He's the God-man Savior, died on the cross for our sins. That's his reputation. He's God the Creator. He's God the Judge. He's going to be the King of kings and Lord of lords and a plethora of other things that Jesus Christ is in the Scripture. But in our context, he is basically the one who provided so great salvation. And so here it says the name. If you believe in that and you're reviled because of the name of Christ, you all are blessed. Wow. Here you felt like you were cursed because this person's reviling you and basically spitting in your eye, mentally, verbally, or physically. And yet it says here, you are blessed. Uh, and so he says, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now, the spirit of glory refers to the Holy Spirit. And you'll notice in the New American Standard, they capitalize it. Well, there were no capitals, or I shouldn't say that. There were all capitals in the original writings, but they believe this is a reference to the Holy Spirit, and I concur. Often when the context, uh, when the uh, writers of the Scripture in English, they'll capitalize if they think it refers to the Holy Spirit. And so I would concur with them in this passage. The Spirit of glory, Holy Spirit, and of God. Why is God separate? This would be God the Father. So God the Father here is by the word God. Normally when we see the definite article with theos, it refers to one of the members of the Trinity. Or if it doesn't have the article, it refers to the attributes of God, the three persons. Here at least the spirit is separate and God is separate, but we have the whole Trinity because in the first part of the verse, what did we have? We had Christ, okay? And so the name of Christ and then the spirit of glory and of God, I would suggest God the Father rests upon you. The spirit of glory and of God himself rests upon you. Now look at verse 15. By no means let any of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or just a troublesome meddler. Wow. Well, I'm not a murderer as far as I don't, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not an evildoer, I don't think. Uh, I'm not a thief. Well, I, I stole some chewing gum when I was young, you know, but the idea that uh, a troublesome meddler, a lot of people that get in that, they mind everybody's business and they just meddle in things that are not their concern instead of just letting it go. Give the gospel, be friendly, respectful, honorable, and otherwise let it go. By no means let any of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. We talked about this in 1 Peter 3.14, where you are to be reviled there for righteousness. Or we already seen it uh, in the earlier verse here. And so uh, we see that the sufferings of Christ, if we had looked at verse 13 there, we get to share in the sufferings of Christ. And we're to keep rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. That'll be at the rapture of the church. That'll be at the judgment seat of Christ. And we will have joy and exultation. And 
If you've suffered above and beyond, as it were, the call of duty of a Christian, you will receive a decoration, a Stephanus, a wreath of victory for overcoming that adversity and allowing God the Spirit to work. Verse 16, but if, and they have anyone suffers as a Christian, that's not in the original, but it's implied by the context. If anyone suffers as a Christian, in the Greek it simply says, but if, as a Christian, maybe we're talking to Christians in here, since most of these people that Peter is writing to are Hebrew Christians. This is one of what we call the Hebrew epistles written to Jewish believers in Yeshua, the Messiah. And if anyone suffers as a Christian, y'all, let him not feel ashamed. In our passage over there, it said uh, that anyone who opposes is a sign of their destruction. Here it says not to be ashamed. Paul even says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Powerful statement. He's not ashamed. I think sometimes we're ashamed of the gospel. We're afraid to say anything because we might offend somebody. Maybe we have a friend that uh, we spend a great deal of time with, but we're afraid to talk about spiritual things because we might offend that person. Maybe they're involved in some kind of sin, and uh, you don't want to talk about Jesus because that might offend them, and and then they don't want to be your friend, or they don't want to go places with you. And so you need to be careful about uh, being ashamed of the gospel to present it to friends and colleagues and you know you don't have to beat them up with it but you need to let them know where you stand and if that offends them well let it go but if they offend you likewise you got to let it go and so he says here if any suffers as a christian that would be the passage that we noted up in verse 14 reviled for the name of christ if you suffer as a christian let him that is the person that is suffering not feel ashamed but in that name let him glorify god for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of god i know i'm not teaching peter right now but boy i'll tell you the household of god is a mess and i mean the local church local churches are kind of social gatherings today people come when they feel like it they don't come because somebody has offended them or the pastor didn't teach them something they like I'll tell you, church is a smorgasbord. If you don't like one church or the pastor doesn't part his hair right, you'll go somewhere else. Not going to go back to that church. It's amazing. People can't sit still for sound teaching. But it says in the last days they will not hold or stand for sound teaching. They want to have their ears tickled. And uh, so there will be those who will tickle their ears, make them feel good. It's all about feeling today in the local church. Well, I'll tell you, it's not about feeling here. If I make you feel uncomfortable, I'm doing my job. Mm -hmm. If you feel a little too comfortable in a local church, it's because you're not being taught. You're being entertained. And you go, oh, Pastor, I felt so good being here today. What a warm feeling. If I was a pastor, I'd say, boy, I messed up today. Mm -hmm. I didn't offend anybody. As a pastor, you ought to be able to at least offend somebody with the word of God. Because the word of God is offensive to the unsaved. It's offensive to the believer who's out of fellowship and needs to be straightened up. Gee, was I preaching again? Pardon me. I hope I didn't offend anyone today. (laughs) Judgment to begin in the household of God. And if it begins with us first, first class condition, and it does. What will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? If the household of God is disciplined because of their lack of uh, obedience to attending, being part of the local church and the function of the local church, and if there's judgment for them and discipline for them, wow, what about the unsaved who won't even darken the door of a church? At least people who come to church are there. They might get a principle or two. If they're not saved, they might even get the gospel if they're fortunate in a church that even preaches the gospel. So today, it's like the Laodicean church. If you're familiar, in Revelation chapter 3, it talks about the Laodicean church. It was a church in the first century, but many people believe it's typical of every church age, every age of the church 
uh, history, but some believe it has to do with the latter days, which would be the days we live in. And the uh, church of Laodicea was the lukewarm church. It wasn't hot. Yeah, it wasn't cold. It was a mediocre church. They kind of came when they felt like it. They came and they were entertained. If the entertainment wasn't up to it, you know, sometimes they'll say, is pastor teaching today? No, his assistant is passing. Oh, I'll pass up today. I don't need to fellowship with the believers. You know, this kind of nonsense goes on all over the place. If it isn't, what's he teaching on? Oh, he's teaching, he's teaching on uh, uh, the gifts of the Spirit. Well, I'm interested in marriage. When's he going to teach on marriage? Then I'll come back. You know, if it's not a subject they like, they're not going to come. It's just amazing today. Local church is an add-on. It's an add-on to your life. If you don't have anything else going on, you'll go to church. Isn't that sad? If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not feel ashamed, but in the name of Christ, glorify God. The judgment begins in the household of God. And if it begins with us first, and it does, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? There it is in Peter. Verse 18, and if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved. Now, how is the righteous saved here? This has nothing to do with phase one salvation. The righteous, you're not righteous as an unbeliever. So people say the righteous can be saved. No, there's no righteous unbelievers, period. So it says, if it's difficult that the righteous believers are saved, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Sure. Saved here is phase two. If the righteous person, here it says, if uh, it is with difficulty that those who are believers and are righteous is delivered, what will become the outcome of the godless man and the sinner who not only is not saved, born again, and in, in, uh, in view, in, uh, uh, implanted with righteousness, but lives a righteous life. Therefore, Peter gets to the end of this section. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God entrust their soul to a faithful creator in doing what is right. If you're uh, accused, if you're reviled, if you're persecuted, if you're opposed, uh, whatever it is, obviously God has your back, and ultimately your reward will be great. Well, uh, that was one that I wanted to add on. Others that we have in terms of this opposition, I wanted to look at a couple of Old Testament passages. Uh, go over to Isaiah chapter 8, 12. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 12. Verse 12 says this, You are not to say, it's conspiracy. In regard to all this people call conspiracy. Don't get into these. I've got people who are into the conspiracy thing. There are some conspiracies out there, but people overstate everything's everybody's in some kind of conspiracy. I'll tell you what the conspiracy is. It's satanic. It is the devil who has a conspiracy against the word of God. That's the conspiracy. But he's saying here, uh, don't be talking about everything's a conspiracy. You are not to be fearful what they fear or to be in dread of it whatever they call conspiracy, may or may not be a conspiracy in the world system. The real conspiracy is Satan attacks God, he attacks his word, he attacks his son, he attacks his people. That's the conspiracy. They talk about this conspiracy, and uh, you look at the television, uh, you got all kinds of conspiracies in the body politic. Uh, I'm not even going to list all the different things. I see it on the television many times. Oh, there's this group, and there's that group, and they, you know, they're trying to control the world money situation, and many people blame the Hebrew people as if they controlled the world money system. On and on and on, blaming everybody. There's a conspiracy. The only conspiracy is Satan and his demon horde who is attacking God and his Christ and his word. That's the conspiracy. The rest of it is just nonsense or at the very least nearly, not nearly, as important. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy. That's what you should think about. And he shall be your fear. 
You want to be, worry about something? Fear the Lord. Now, the fear of the Lord is for the unbeliever. For the believer, it's a reverential awe. It's the Hebrew verb yareh, which means to be fearful. But it can also be to revere or to honor. When it refers to the believer, it is to honor and revere. When it refers to the unbeliever in context, they ought to be scared. As Dr. Goosey used to say, it's a scary business to fall into the hands of the living God. And he shall be your dread. If there's anything to be fearful of, it's the Lord. And then he shall be your sanctuary. Your sanctuary, in other words, we enter into the sanctuary. Well, when we come to church, people say, well, are you sitting in the front or the back of the sanctuary? I, I don't know what to answer because I am the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And whether I sit in the front or the back, I am the sanctuary. It's where God dwells because he dwells in me. The idea of a building having a sanctuary is secondary. The sanctuary is you. You are the place where God resides. The Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son, all are in you, the sanctuary. Well, what is this saying? Father, God, has become the sanctuary because we believe in Christ. We're entered into union with Christ, seated at the Father's right hand. That's the sanctuary. He's in us. We are the sanctuary. We are in him at the right hand of the Father in his sanctuary. I didn't mean to interpret this passage, but sometimes we get into the Old Testament. People say, what does he mean, sanctuary? What does he mean? And he says, both to, but to both the houses of Israel. The houses of Israel, of course, we have the northern kingdom, Judah, southern kingdom, northern kingdom sometimes called Israel, but the southern kingdom called Judah, the houses of Israel. A stone and a rock to stumble over and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many will stumble over them. This is quoted in the New Testament, as you're probably familiar, over in uh, a number of passages, Romans 9, for example, and it says, and many will stumble over them. Then they will fall and be broken. They will even be snared and caught. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among the disciples, and I will wait for the Lord, says Isaiah. So we have this Old Testament passage that talks about, again, uh, these things of <clears throat> suffering. Uh, let's go to Psalms, Psalms 56. All this deals with suffering for righteousness sake or suffering because of foolishness. I guess you could say our message is about suffering for Christ. Psalm 56 Verse 11, 66, verse 11. In God I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid what a man can do unto me. We see that referred over and over. I think it's in the Proverbs. It's in the New Testament. Do not fear what man can do to you. And man can do horrible things. We've seen that over in Israel. Uh, we've seen it back in the days of the Holocaust. What man can do to man is horrific. The terrorist and the terror that try to people put upon other people is just almost unbelievable. The torture, but yet the scripture says, do not fear what man can do to me or to you, basically, in this passage. So in Psalm 56, 11, we see that. And go over to Psalm 118, 118. Psalm 118, verses 6 through 9. Psalm 118, 6 through 9, says this, The Lord is for me, I will not fear what a man can do to me. Another passage, but he goes on, The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore I shall look uh, with satisfaction on those who hate me. What? Let me read that again. Therefore I look with satisfaction on those who hate me. Well, our passage says those who hate me, that's a sign that you've done your job. Why are they hating you? Because you've given them the gospel. You're a believer. That's why they hate you. And you should almost, it says here, you should have satisfaction. Now, that word isn't in the Hebrew. It simply says, therefore, I look on those who hate me. <clears throat> They've added the concept, and it comes from basically passages like ours. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Who are the princes? Well, 
we would think of princes as rulers, but in the Old Testament, many times, it, princes refer to demons, that is, fallen angels. I don't know which it is here in the context, so it could be demon generals who are responsible for national leadership. In fact, we find that over in Ezekiel when it talks about the prince, and then it talks about Satan, and at the same time, in the same chapter, on the one hand, it's talking about the ruler uh, being the king, and then, of course, the prince, who is basically a demon who is in charge of that particular nation. Da Daniel found the same thing uh, when he made a prayer, and the angel came and said, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. Sorry about that. He said, I've been on my way. Uh, the Lord heard your prayer, and he sent me, but I got hung up. I was fighting with a demon. That's in the book of Daniel. You can check that out. And just, uh, you know, so sometimes your prayer is being answered, but there may be some traffic jams where the angel that's coming to give you the answer and deliver you gets hung up fighting with a demon somewhere. There's a whole war going on in the area of the universe. People often say, well, there's, I think there's aliens out there. There are. There's angels everywhere in the universe. There are elect angels. There are fallen angels. And, of course, there is combat between those angels, God's elect angels and the fallen angels, subject for another time. All right, so we have this one. And then, uh, let's see, did I, I did that one. Uh, one last one over in Hebrews. Let's check out Hebrews chapter 13. If you were with us, we studied the entire book of Hebrews. If you missed that, it's available on video at our website. You can go to YouTube or to Judy Glennie, my wife's Facebook page. And so this is a, an epistle written to Hebrew Christians. We don't know who authored it. Some think Paul, I think Apollos. Be that as it may, in chapter 13, he addresses this same issue that we see in Peter, the same issue that we see Paul addressing multiple times, and in our passage in Philippians chapter 1, 27 through 29. And here in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 6, we read this. Let's see if I want to go back, verse 5. Now, <clears throat> let your way of life be free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has, uh, be, uh, let's see, if he, he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently said, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid, what shall a man do unto me? So we have it right here, and then verse 7 caps it off, remember those who led you. Think about your pastor teacher, or if you've come through several churches, one of your pastors went to be with the Lord, you may have another pastor. You should have a pastor teacher. You should have a local assembly to fellowship with so your spiritual gift can function, so you can fellowship, so you can rejoice in the Lord, so you can sing the hymns and the psalms and therefore worship in song and melody. That's in the local church. And so led those who led you, remember those who spoke the word of God to you and considering the outcome of their way of life, imitate, notice, their faith. Paul talked about imitating him, but he clarified it. And here the writer of Hebrews clarifies further and says, imitate the man of God's word, what he teaches, not necessarily the man. Hopefully the man of God has a, a, a reputation that is impeccable, but all of us have old sin natures, and your pastor may sin from time to time. I know that's hard to believe, mm. but it could happen. And I have to use 1 John 1, 9. Who knew? We all have to confess our sins. So I'm a sinner saved by grace. I confess my sins as I become aware. I may commit a sin I didn't even know. And I look in the word of God and I say, Oy vey, that's a Hebrew expression. <laughs> Woe is me that I've committed sin. I confess it to the Father. 1 John 1, 9. I'm restored to fellowship and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Well, we've gone through a lot of these verses, <clears throat> pardon me, in connection with opposition. I hope we've made some sense. All of this is basically what's called a proof or evidence. Evidence of the unsaved, which are going to be destroyed in the lake of fire. Evidence of believers. We have this word used only four times in the New Testament for evidence or proof or a sign 
We see it over in 2 Corinthians 8, 24, having therefore uh, to show love uh, uh, both to Timothy and Titus and the evidence to them. And then we see the Lord's death and resurrection, which gave evidence and proof that he was, in fact, the Messiah. We see that in Romans 3, 25 and 26. You want to see that? Let's go there. We have time, I think. Romans chapter 3, 25. I hate to leave passages unexamined. Theoretically, you'll go back and examine them, and those who are taking notes, but a lot of times people don't. They take their notes, and they put them in a notebook, and they store it somewhere. Mm -hmm. Your notebook is to refer back to in your personal devotion and study time. Romans chapter 3, verse 25 and 26. Here it says, For indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become nothing to you. It therefore, if therefore uncircumcision, or the uncircumcised man, that would be the Gentile, because the Jews were circumcised, keeps the requirements of the law, will not his circumcision be regarded as circumcision? I thought the word sign was there. Where am I missing it? I'm in chapter 2. Great verse. Missed it again. All right, bear with me. I'm sorry, my pages sometimes stick together. Does your Bible do that? My Bible has so many pages that are got writing on them. I was accused one time. Oh, someone said, you write in your Bible? <laughs> every page, every page. In fact, I had to finally stop doing it and write on separate paper because I could hardly read the text and the pages stick together. So my apology for that. All right, let's try it again. Romans chapter 3. I think I'm going to be there now. There's 4, there's 3, and there's 25. Okay, I'm there now, 25. Uh, actually, we're coming in in the middle of a context. Whom God displayed uh, here, uh, that is, he displayed publicly. This, of course, is from the previous verse, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood, that is the death of Christ on the cross, through faith, that is your faith, this was the fact that he was to demonstrate his righteousness. So this is the propitiation or the demonstration because of the fair forbearance of God. Uh, he passed over in previous generations and previously uh, those that had been committed. Verse 26, for I'm having trouble reading my text. I've got things written here. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So the concept here is the evidence that we have in Jesus Christ, who is the righteous one. And so uh, that uh, simply talks about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as evidence and proof of his deity and his saviorship. They proof, and let's see, we're about out of time here. The proof for them of destruction, but to you all, it's proof of deliverance. That's phase two deliverance. Your suffering at the hands of opposition. Well, we'll come back and pick it up next time in verse 29, Philippians 1.29. So we go over there to Philippians, and we're almost at the end of this chapter 29 and 30 the last two phrases and here of course it says for to you it has been granted for christ's sake not only to believe in him but also to suffer for him so there is suffering in the christian life for those who don't teach that uh, make a, <laughs> uh, really do a disservice to the christian doesn't mean every day we have days of great uh, honor and valor and high points, but there are days and times when we suffer adversity from opponents, from circumstances, and we need to trust the Lord in all these situations and not to fear what a man can do unto us. Father God, thank you so much for another opportunity to study your word. We thank you for the, the passages that we have considered this morning, and we pray for that one person who's here this morning without Christ, without hope, and without everlasting life, without forgiveness of sins. 
We want you to know that God had you personally in mind when he sent his son, the second member of the Trinity, undiminished deity, into human history through the virgin birth into a sinless human body. And that body was the person of Jesus Christ who went to the cross because he was qualified as a sinless sacrifice to bear the sins of the world. John said, Behold the Lamb of God, speaking of Jesus, who takes away the sin of the world. And he did just that. He bore the sins of the world. And you can have salvation right now, right where you sit, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, his only born son, his only called and chosen son, that whosoever, that's anybody, if that's you, put your name in there. John, Bill, Bob, whatever it is, put your name in. Anybody who believes in him, believes what? Believes that Jesus Christ is undiminished deity, true God perfect God, and true humanity, and sinless humanity, joining with us in all things except sin, therefore qualified to go to the cross and bear the sins, all sins, present, past sins, future sins, once and for all sins, once and for all time, once and for all people, and you can have it right where you sit right now. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He gives to us everlasting life. He gives us forgiveness of sins. He gives us a multitude of blessings in this life and in the life to come, blessing and potential rewards. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus, of course, makes the acclamation that all you need to do is to believe throughout the Gospel of John some 98 times. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Won't you do it before you leave? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, thank you again for the opportunity of studying these passages. May the Father, you be glorified as well as your Son for all eternity. Thank you for the blessing you give us in this life. We look forward to spending eternity with your son, Jesus Christ, in glory. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father, and thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.